Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm Meryl Kalili, and this is another DM25 live debate, except it's not exactly a live debate because it's Christmas and it's the last live debate of our fortnightly debates of the year. Quite a mouthful. And this time we've got a special kind of holiday live stream where we're going to tap our panel for their personal recommendations for uh, what, what kind of content they've consumed, books, music, podcasts, whatever, during 2022, and also get a retrospective of the last year as we move ahead into the next one. And you, you out there, if you've got thoughts, comments, questions, rants, concerns, recommendations of your own, then please put them in the YouTube chat because this is live. And the last thing, because this is a bit of a different, uh, a different call this time, one of you will have the opportunity to win some nice DM25 merchandise. There is a pinned link in the chat now. I'm talking about the people who are joining us on the chat now uh, on YouTube. So please click that link, the pinned link, enter your name and email address in the next 45 minutes. And at the end of the call, we will draw one lucky winner um, and get that merchandise sent off to you. Okay, let me hand the floor over to Yanis to kick us off. Yanis, 2022, go for it. Well, what a fantastic year that was. Um, <laughs> uh, war, a return to Europe. <laughs> um, the left uh, has been uh, at its weakest and most pathetic state in the history of the last hundred years. Uh, we, um, here in Greece, our electoral wing, as we call it, the Mera 25, uh, we have been very happy about the fact that we are still surviving and we have a decent chance of improving in our performance in in the forthcoming election which is you can tell that we are in a festive mood today that i am in a festive mood we are doing really badly in in absolute numbers, uh, we are celebrating the fact that we, you know, our little party may be doing five percent, which is, you know, considerably more than the three point four four percent that we got in in the two thousand nineteen election. And I can see on the face of our comrades uh, ecstasy. We are really very happy about that, and you know, we have reason to be happy because we are improving uh, in a, in a year when the left is collapsing everywhere. And, uh, you know, we are being uh, absolutely defeated, left, right, and center by the fascists on the one hand. Look, Meloni is, is prime minister in Italy. Who would have thought that in the year 2022, um, a politician who grew up worshiping Benito Mussolini would manage to go from 4% in the previous election to, to government in Italy? And yet we, Meta25, we're ecstatic that we're going from 344, 3 almost 4%, to 5%. <laughs> so um, um, I think that, you know, I'm sorry, but there's somebody falling all the time incessantly, uh, obviously wanting to share the, uh, the, the brilliant success story that DM25 is. Uh, look, I'm... <laughs> I think that this is the time of the year, the festive season, when we have to be very cynical and extremely self-deprecating. Because if we don't do it now, when are we going to do it? Now, there is a, a serious aspect to what I'm saying. Um, DiEM25 is simultaneously a catastrophe and a brilliant success. Uh, we, it is a catastrophe because think about it. We, you know, we started in February 2016 in Berlin at the Volkspoon Theatre, packed. We had um, tens of thousands of people joining us. We had a, a huge ambition, to effectively, to take over Europe from the oligarchy. Um, it hasn't worked. It really hasn't worked. In that sense, if you compare our pathetic performance in the last, what is it, uh, six years, seven years, with the fascists and the bankers and the Mario Draghi's and the Christine Lagarde's and the Emmanuel Macron's of the of the world, we've been a miserable lot. But at the same time, we've kept the flame 
a light. And we are here. We are growing at very low rates while the world around us has gone completely and utterly berserk. You know, we have a situation where a former KGB colonel has uh, committed a great nation, Russia, uh, to a, a genocidal war in Ukraine. You have parts of the left in Europe proclaiming NATO, whose only interest is in propagating its own imperialistic existence uh, by prolonging that war in Ukraine until everybody's dead. If they could, they would. Mm. Uh, so part, and, and yet parts of the left are proclaiming NATO to be a kind of anti-colonial alliance. <laughs> um, the, the world has gone mad all over us. Uh, Europe is no longer. I mean, the, the whole notion of the European Union, which we were, going, we were going to democratize in the year 2022, has proven uh, unfit for purpose. The European Union doesn't exist, in, in my view. Uh, it's been taken over by NATO. It's been taken over by the warmongers. Uh, uh, look at the situation in Ukraine as it's going to be shaping up in the next months or years in relation to the European Union that we try to democratize in order to save it and make it a, a force for good in Europe. What a pathetic idea that was. <laughs> what a pathetic outcome we have. Okay, let's... Let's be slightly serious, and I will conclude on a on a serious and at the same time comical note. At some point, what Dean has been saying from the beginning, that is that only a peace process and a peace treaty will conclude the war in Ukraine. This is, is now becoming clear in the mind of any um, clear thinking person in the world. This quagmire cannot be resolved by military means. Putin will neither win nor lose. The Ukrainians and NATO will neither win nor lose. So a peace process is going to start at some point. The European Union is going to be absent from it. By definition, by definition, it will, the European Union will be irrelevant. And it's actually going to be worse than being irrelevant. Here is my thinking. Suppose, not suppose, you know, conjure up in your head, in your mind, the first meeting at some, you know, Reykjavik or somewhere where these summits take place, these negotiations, peace processes take place, Oslo, wherever, Beijing, um, you know, New Delhi, where the American representatives of the Zelensky government and Russia, uh, maybe Beijing, maybe Turkey, are uh, uh, meeting in order to carve out a peace process. Who is going to represent the European Union? This is a tragic question because there is no answer to it. It can't be Macron or Olaf Scholz because they will be vetoed by the warmongers from the Baltics, from Estonia, from you know Poland, from Finland. The Eastern and Northeastern member states of the European Union consider Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz to be Putin appeasers. They will never accept someone like Macron or Scholz to represent the European Union. At the same time, since the European Union is the Franco-German accent, accent axis, uh, without France and Germany, there they, they can be no European Union. And certainly there will be no wad of money to pay for Ukraine's reconstruction without France or Germany. Uh, Berlin and Paris are going to veto, let's say, Ms. Kallas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, <laughs> representing the European Union. Ursula von der Leyen, um, Mr. Borrell, uh, Mr. Michel, the President of the European Union Council. You just need to state their names to realize how comic it would be if they represented the European Union. So none of these people can represent the European Union. So the European Union is not simply not going to be represented. Maybe it will be there in order to, you know, to wave the flag, but they will play absolutely no role in resolving the war in the heart of Europe. But they will be made by the United States to pay for any peace treaty and for the reconstruction of Ukraine. Uh, because that's what the Americans do. 
when the Americans invaded Iraq under Bush number one, back in the, in, in the early 90s, they made the Saudis and the Emiratis pay for their invasion. Wherever they invade, they make somebody else pay for it. The Americans are, are you know, leading the war effort in the Ukraine. They send all the, the weaponry and they get paid for it. There's no doubt of that. But they will make the European Union pay approximately, uh, the European Investment Bank came out with a, with a number for it, 1.1 trillion euros is the sum that they came up with, the minimum that would be necessary to reconstruct the Ukraine. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a bit more than the total budget of the European Union for six years. The total budget for the European Union for six years is a bit less than what will be necessary to reconstruct the Ukraine. So it's clear that the European Union budget is not going to be able to sustain that. So they will need to create a new common debt the way, in the way that they created new common debt uh, for a much larger, a much smaller sum for the recovery fund. Okay, but we know that already there's going to be, already we already know there's going to be a massive um, re react, negative response to that in Berlin. Already, the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe has ruled out any new common debt, and they they have explicitly told the German government that okay, they tolerated the pandemic recovery fund, but new common debt at the level of the EU will not be tolerated by the Constitutional Court of Germany. Um, and let, but nevertheless, let's say that uh, the, the government in Berlin finds a way of bypassing its Constitutional Court. Uh, I cannot in my life imagine how the Spanish would agree to sharing the burden of this huge amount of money when it will be German companies that mainly uh, German and French companies that mainly benefit from the contracts and the procurement that goes hand in hand with the rebuilding of Ukraine. Uh, I cannot see if, uh, in my mind, in my mind's eye, Mr. Orban in Hungary agreeing to any of this unless he gets huge concessions that the rest of Europe will never want to give him. I cannot see how Meloni is not going to use this as a magnificent opportunity to exact a pound of flesh regarding, you know, torturing the refugees <laughs> that arrive on, on Italian soil or doing whatever it is that uh, the Meloni government wants to uh, demonstrate a capacity for accomplishing uh, against the interests of humanity in order to justify the fact that they, they, they became the government of Italy. In other words, our little movement that began with great ambitions in uh, 2016, was proven spectacularly correct in predicting that this Europe is gone, will be a goner, unless our DiEM25 manifesto of democratizing Europe succeeds. We were completely, spectacularly successful in predicting that. And at the same time, we live in a Europe that squeezes us out of existence, more or less, not out of existence, but squeezes us into a minimalist role because we are caught up in a huge conflict, which we predicted, a conflict between two varieties of authoritarianism, the authoritarianism of Brussels and Frankfurt, of the liberal establishment, the corrupt liberal establishment. We now have complete evidence. Look at the, 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 the Qatar gate scandal in Brussels, that this opaque, non-transparent, corrupt, reactionary, right-wing, democracy-free zone called the European Union, um, is creating one crisis after, after the other. And now that there's a war in its vicinity, it is ruling itself out of play, out of the game. The liberal establishment that it was responsible for this debacle is sort of caught up in a duel with a fascist, neo-fascist uh, uprising in the Melonis, the Urbans, the Polish government, the Le Pens, and so on. But at the same time, the two are, as we said from the beginning, um, each other's accomplices. And it is voices like DiEM25 that never get heard beyond YouTube, beyond live streaming events like ours, today, tonight. It is a delicious contradiction between a grand success and a spectacular failure. That's DiEM25. 
but as long as we are alive and we keep this candle alight, um, we have a reason to exist. And, um, you know, the night is darkest just before that little light starts glowing and glowing and glowing and maybe, you know, bringing in a proper day. By the way, this is what Mera means. This is uh, the name that we used for our electoral wing. Uh, you know, the day that comes after the night. This is our hope. It probably won't happen. But it's a good struggle to fight and to keep fighting. And it's a good dream to have during this festive season. That was my lot. Thank you, Yanis, for that bittersweet retrospective. Um, Juliana, Juliana Zita from Germany. How was your 2022? And what might your recommendations be? Maybe you can also include those for people watching in terms of things to absorb, content to get stuck into. Juliana. Uh, thank you, Mehran. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yes, uh, just still processing what Janice just said. <laughs> uh, no, I think 2022 was, uh, I mean, after the last two years, was for sure not a better year for anyone. And I mean, if even if sometimes, of course, positive things happen in our lives, it's just uh, hard to be ignorant of what's happening around us. And for sure, if you see all the crisis evolving, like inflation and all those things that most people are hit by, I mean, uh, yes, the war broke out. And uh, for example, and the devastation that's happening there is one thing, but it spreads through all our lives, the, the kind of, you know, it's like a domino effect um, that invades all of our lives. So I think it's really difficult. What I've realized 2022 is that you have to put in effort to stay positive because, it, you know, it's sometimes you just want to put the, your head in the sand and be just ignorant of everything around us. Um, and I think that, that the next years will be much harder even that it's it's really on people in political organizations and the left to really wake up at some point and focus on really important uh, topics uh, like what's influencing most of people. Uh, I mean, the left in Germany, for example, is is if you if you see it like almost dead, and then I see it on the positive that many people who are learning of Mera 25 in Germany um, are really, you know, reacting positive to it. And they are kind of getting pushy, like, why are you not doing more? <laughs> why are you not doing this? Why aren't you at these elections? You know, and that's a positive sign that there is an urge for, for new parties, for new, uh, you know, kind of uh, to keep this fire alive, as, as Jana said. Um, and that's what's at the end motivating me to, you know, stick to the task. And I think in terms of what we have done the past year since we existed in, in Germany as Mela 25, can say, yeah, we founded our first, uh, you know, branch in, in Bremen, uh, which was just this month. Um, and I'm really happy and proud that the group uh, in Bremen mostly uh, has done this amazing work. We will have our first elections next year, so everything will be focused on that. And that will be amazing for us as a first milestone to see what we can do uh, and what we can accomplish with the little resources that we have. But also, you know, the task to become uh, a larger organ uh, party will be uh, very difficult for us. But, but you know, you have to kind of uh, keep going. Um, and... Yeah, I think that 2022 has been a very, um, you know, a year where I've, where we've learned a lot in terms also of founding a party and then being very serious because the last time we had the party, we, we were just concentrated on European elections, but now it's just something else. And now you're in this, you know, also in this mind of what's happening nationally much more. And then you can see the I mean, one funny thing is the word of the year in Germany, 2022, is Zeitwende. And it's out of Scholz's speech after the war breakout. And it's it's kind of, it's like turning point. 
And I'm still thinking about what that turning point was. Like, what, how could this be a, like a positive turning point? Because what it actually kind of means is like from the perspective of our government is that the turning point is that now Germany has this leadership in the world and that we're pumping up the military and so on. And this scares people, obviously. But also if you look at the left and neoliberals also, but especially at the left, many are falling for that. And I think this is also a huge danger in Germany that you know what we see in Italy may happen in Germany as well at some point, that many people will fall into the you know, hands of the right wingers because they are more critical of these things than the left, for example. So there is a void to fill. And I hope that, well, we can accomplish that at some point, but it will be a slow process, especially with that few people that we are. And I hope that many more will join at some point. Um, yeah, personally, we talked about it. I, I didn't have much time to read this year, so I'm a bit short on books recommendations. And I have, if if so, I have only one German book that I hope gets translated in uh, English, to be honest. And it's from a person that was in our board a few years ago, uh, from Juliane Marie Schreiber. It's about the terror of the positive thinking, um, which is kind of this neoliberal notion that people who suffer and who are poor it's their fault because they didn't self-improve enough and they are not thinking positive enough. So <laughs> I really like the book because it's kind of, you know, pushing people to be angry. Like you can be angry about things and you, you are allowed to complain about the system and it's not your fault if you're poor. Uh, there's something wrong, you know, with the political system that we're, uh, yeah, so far. Maybe I come back later with some movie recommendations. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that, Juliana. Dushan, Dushan Pajovic from Montenegro. Thanks. Thanks, Mehran. Regarding everything, uh, 2002 was definitely a lot, uh, for me at least. And uh, we did a lot of activism, and I expect to do much more activism in 2023. And I invite everyone who is keen on doing direct action, civil disobedience, but also more some less complex uh, actions to join us. And I also invite our DMers who are watching this to <clears throat> be involved with the regular calls. And we are more than open to have one-on-one -on -one calls, to have calls with local collectives and so on and so on. So this is the right time to start and to engage with the M25, really. If you haven't until now, I don't know what you're waiting for. Uh, we had lots of battles, me personally and the M25 as well, uh, both wins and losses, of course. I started on a more personal note to write more regularly for Montenegrin media, to be more present in the public political sphere. But that also took some tool on, on my health in general. And a lot of comrades tonight are either suffering some, some things or uh, are not even here because of the, their health. So many regards to them. And uh, just a point for our viewers who are excellent that they should take care of themselves, take care of their mental health. Of course, we need to change Europe and to change our countries and the world, but all of that cannot be sustainable if we don't look after ourselves. So my personal goal is to keep somewhat similar pace, but to survive uh, all of that mentally and physically, uh, to help DM25 to get on our feet in Montenegro as well, not just in EU and UK. And finally, to give some uh, recommendations. Uh, so Macron asked us to be uh, the least political as possible. So I will try to keep, <laughs> keep that in mind. Regarding the music, uh, my biggest recommendation are the guys that just came back after a long pause, which is No Clear Mind. It's a Greek band, actually, that is really, really underrated. So give them some love if you like post-rock and alternative rock. Uh, regarding the movies and TV shows, Archive 81, 
it's hard for me not to spoil that one, so I will just skip it. Uh, on the second note, if you like to rest a bit and to take your brain out in the walk to just uh, have a nice pace, then Studio 666. It's a horror comedy, even though I hate that genre, but it's the movie made by Foo Fighters. So if you like that band, you will like it uh, for sure. Uh, something that is also apolitical as long as it can be for those people who are just listening this i'm just putting quote unquote uh board of warcraft is back so yeah i played it as a teen you can play wrath of the lich king again also the new expansion dragonflight you can put your mind to rest there and finally, my book recommendation is Anomalia by Andrei Nikolaidis, Montenegrin writer of Greek descent. Uh, Anomaly is in English. I'm not sure if it's translated already. But if you like the work of Sreczko Horvat, you are going to love uh, Andrei Nikolaidis as well. A really, really similar writing. They're friends, so you can assume that we can assume they influence each other. This book is a novel about apocalypse where nine different stories happen at the same time where the time and space collapses due, due to some kind of glitch in universe. I won't spoil it anymore. So that's, that's it from me. Thank you, Dushan. Very uh, detailed list of recommendations there. And last time we did this, like a year ago, we did discover that many of you guys are actually secret gamers. So please uh, please also include your gaming recommendations uh, if you're not still playing the same stuff you were playing a year ago. Uh, Danai, Danai Stratu, the floor is yours. So, um, well, I believe uh, that all these uh, difficulties that we have been facing for the last year, all the ones that the previous speakers have talked about, make us more radical. It, it, it's a clear path that we need to become, and we are becoming much more radical in our positions. And uh, I think this is a good thing because it makes us more uh, sure of that this is the right way and we need to be, uh, to, to, to remain with our convictions and continue in this path. Um, I see that we are gaining the trust of many young people, and this makes me hopeful in Greece. Um, maybe we're we're doing really well with, with people from like 16, 17 to 25, uh, and we're gaining momentum in all ages, but, but having the young people follow us and joining us in uh, Mera 25 and DM in Greece is, is great. Um, Recently, we went with Eric to Cyprus and other members of Diem, and we saw that also the young people there are becoming uh, energized. They want to, they, there is a need for our progressive um, movement. And uh, this, uh, this, this is very, very hopeful for me that people are, we're, Mera 25s and Diem is expanding. We're having more a new, like in Italy, we, had, we founded the new DM, and all this is great. Um, as far as the, uh, we have done a lot of activities with Meta, which is the, the artistic platform of uh, both Meta, DM, and the Progressive International. And we see that there as well, we have many, many new people uh, joining us to our events, that uh, the combination of politics and art is is really it makes sense at this point for the young people. We'll have many people who would never go to uh, clearly political events, but they are interested in is in this dialogue between the arts and the politics in joining us. They join us a lot when we show movies and we have the directors uh, uh, in a Q and A. Uh, we have like uh, queues of people who want to, to follow our events. Recently, we had an event with uh, Yanis Xenakis, which is the, the, it was the 100 years, this year is 100 years from his birth. And so 
again, we're talking about that because he was an extremely, uh, he was a fighter. He, uh, he, he, he was in a, a terrible, uh, I mean, they destroyed, he was in a, he was destroyed by a bomb and by the, you know, the radical uh, protests back then, uh, and uh, with the junta and before the junta and grace, uh, which of course led to his extortion. And he was uh, he was in 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 France for all the years. And uh, now his music, which was extremely progressive and radical back then, is again being discussed and reinvented uh, and played by younger people in, in different ways. So all this shows that there is a, a need for action. We, 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 don't, we must not give in and stop what we're doing. I think we're doing a, a good job um, and we should continue in this path and just uh, keep growing. As far as the books, another thing I'm proud of, and I have to, it, it, even though it, it, it's addressed to the Greek audience, but I have to say it, is we uh, recently started a collaboration uh, with Topos uh, Publishing House in Greece, uh, and we have uh, already published two books that I'm proud to invite people to, to buy in Greece. And it is the uh, No Bosses of uh, Michael Albert, and of course, the precariat in Greek for the first time, even though so many years, it's been, I think, more than 15 years when it was published in England and in Europe and internationally. Guy Standing's precariat is now also available in Greek. So that's from me. And I hope next year will be more equally interesting, but more positive than this one. Thank you for that, Danai. And, and if you'll allow me to just tap your artistic brain for a second, have, has there been any art that you've consumed over the last year or, or, or books or movies you've seen that have really blown you away? Other, other people's work, I mean? Um, I have seen a movie that did inspire me and it was very moving. It was Shirin Nushat's uh, new movie. Um, I I will find the name and get back to you on this because I, you know it, it, you surprised me by asking. But it is her new movie, uh, which just came out and it did really well in the festivals. It was in Tribeca. It was in Venice. Uh, let me just check. I'll get back to you with the name of the movie. Okay, we'll find it and we'll put the name in the chat. And you guys out there in YouTube chat land, if you've got recommendations uh, to share, please do put them in the YouTube chat, things that you've seen, experienced, uh, content that you've consumed this year um, that uh, you'd like to share, please do, we'll, we'll read it out. Um, I need to clarify something, because I keep getting these messages asking me why I'm in the shower. I'm not in the shower. It might look like a shower curtain, but I'm actually cowering in my parents' bedroom in Luxembourg. Uh, I don't know why they've got like a, a curtain that looks a bit like a shower curtain, but I assure you I'm not in the shower. Uh, okay, Eric, Eric Edmund, our political director. Hey, it's Mehu. We've all been there. We've all cowered in our be parents' bedrooms during the <laughs> Christmas period. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, look, I'll say one thing on politics and then I'll move on to the really interesting and fun stuff, which is all the artistic things. Uh, we're talking about all these things that are going wrong, and they are going horrifically wrong in 2022, even more so than in the previous years, which is impressive how every year seems to be getting worse. But at the same time, I was thinking now while listening to everything, it kind of feels good in a really twisted way. Nothing is working for us, for the left. So we don't really need to conserve anything. It's not like we found a trick. It's not like we have found an angle. It's not like we know exactly what it is that we need to do in a given circumstance and we just need to push on and win. So the fact that things are constantly changing means that we have constant opportunities to try and find that angle that works for us. And I think what Yanis uh, mentioned and some, some of the other um, members of the CC as well is indicative of that. The fact that we are improving in certain circumstances with as things are getting worse and worse is a silver lining. I'm, I don't want to say that it's good because I know that we're all suffering as a result of what is going on in the world right now. But it is 
maybe a small positive element is the fact that it, it might be giving us a chance as a left, a chance that wasn't there in the past. So maybe we should be focusing on that. And as things get progressively worse, to use that to really iron our resolve to do something about it and to engage with these kind of radical alternatives that I feel like our movement represents. And as the situation becomes worse and worse, I think it becomes clearer to ever more people that what DM was saying in the past and sounded a bit radical and a bit over the top to some is actually common sense, especially uh, as, as things change. So that's that on politics. Now, First of all, Dushan, I didn't know that you were on World of Warcraft. I'm also on World of Warcraft. I was I was a World of Warcraft before you even finished primary school, I think. Uh, so I, I'm going to claim uh, primacy there. Uh, I'm still on the same server I was back when I was 13. So I had stopped for many years, but now this new expansion came out, like Dushan said, the Shadowlands, and I'm back on there with my best mate from, from back in the day. And yeah, we're playing. So let's let, let's chat about that. I doubt we're on the same server, but maybe we can create characters. And I, I definitely recommend it. It's got all the magic that the old WoW used to have. It's very fun. And another shout I'd like to give, although I haven't played this in a while, I think I'll probably jump back in because a uh, a patch or, or rather an expansion has come out called Mistland for it that we've been waiting for for many months is, is Valheim which is an open world sandbox game, survival game, cooperative. So if you're into cooperative online games, uh, this is a game where basically you're different Vikings and you're just thrown into this empty, very hostile world and you need to survive in it by building a house, eventually building a boat, exploring the other islands around, finding more resources, building weapons, armor. It's, it's a lot of fun and it's a terrifying uh, time sink. So if you don't have that much time or if you're sensitive to, to, to gaming addiction, <laughs> be careful with it. But it's it's very entertaining. Um, on music, I want to give uh, a little coin to a band that I was very frustrated with until very recently called Ghost. And uh, for, ah, David is actually wearing a t-shirt of the band that I just noticed. So when he speaks later, you'll see him. Uh, so they a bit had this weird turn. They were becoming more and more popular. I'm one of those annoying people who say like, I like them before they were cool, you know? And they've, they've gotten more popular and their music adapted to that popularity a little bit, became a bit more pop. They're, they were a heavy metal band. Uh, but they brought out a new uh, album called Impera, which really bridges this um, approach that they've taken, which was a bit more poppy, a bit more arena, um, operatic rock stuff, and, and connected it with uh, the edginess that they used to have in the early years. So Impera by Ghost, for me, is, is a must. Um, on books, there was one really, really good book this year. Uh, by Hilary Mantel, who, who in fact died this year. Uh, fairly young, I think she was in her 50s, unfortunately, because I think she was one of the best uh, British authors right now. Um, her book was called, is called The Mirror and the Light. And it's the third of a trilogy. Uh, so the final book about the life of Thomas Cromwell, who was the chief minister under Henry VIII in the 16th century in England. And uh, he basically was raised to become a knight and, you know, was well, the most powerful man in the kingdom of England under Henry VIII. Uh, but he was, in fact, the son of a butcher, which for the 16th century is absolutely unheard of. And the kind of challenges that he faced in, in that kind of very hierarchical and classist world is uh, the way it's brought to life by Hilary Mantel in this trilogy. Uh, is really top notch, and the, the the reflections on on power and the interconnection between people and this relationship between people of different classes and the intermixing, it's it's brought to life in, in a completely different and very empathetic way that I haven't come across before. And I'm a big reader of historical fiction, so this trilogy by Hilary Mantel, um, Wolf Hall is the first book, so you need to start with Wolf Hall. Really recommended. Uh, and about movies, I'm going to mention two movies that I haven't watched, but I'm looking forward to watching uh, because they haven't come out yet. One's called Corsage, and it's uh, an alternative take on the life of uh, Empress Sissi of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
It's an uh, Austrian production, I believe, um, directed and starred by, uh, by the same person. And, and the other is called Pale Blue Eye, which is starred by, um, what is his name? The guy who played Batman back in the day. Um, Michael Keaton? Christian Bale. No, ah. Christian Bale. Oh, you just gave away your age, Mehran. I did, I did. Michael I'm, Keaton, I'm <laughs> Christian Bale. <laughs> no, Christian Bale. And he plays a detective who tries to uncover this mystery, true story, uncover a mystery, uh, a, a murder in West Point back in the 19th century. And he recruits a, a local cadet from West Point to help him. And that cadet is, in fact, Edgar Allan Poe, the poet, the Gothic poet. And it's a true story. And it's how Edgar Allan Poe sort of got into all this dark, weird Gothic stuff through the investigation of this murder. So that's coming out this Christmas, and I'm really looking forward to watching it. That's it for me. Thank you, Eric. And in defense of the original Batman movie from 1989 or 1990, of course, we already like that because of Jack Nicholson's incredible performance and Prince's brilliant soundtrack, not because of Michael Keaton, who was a crap Batman. But yes, I am giving away my age. Um, just quickly for you guys out there in the chat, you've got a couple of minutes left to uh, enter our prize giveaway. Our, 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 we've only done this, well, we've never done this before, so this is the only time we're ever doing this. Maybe we'll never do it again. So if you want to win some DM25 merchandise, please click that link that's, in, that's pinned in the chat and enter your name and email address. Some recommendations from you guys in the chat out there. Um, but of course, I can't vouch for it. I'm just, I'm just repeating what you say. Someone recommends Billy Wood's rap music. Someone else recommends the film Triangle of Sadness. Um, in terms of books, Horizon by Barry Lopez that they found super inspiring about our world and our environment. Um, and I'm surprised actually, just, just to bring it back to film, that no one's mentioned Avatar. Have you guys all seen Avatar? You don't want to see Avatar? No, no one's into that. I don't know. I'd love to get on a pair of fantastic 3D glasses and live in another world for three hours. Now, I'm, now I'm talking about the new Avatar, not the old one um because it's on here at the cinema in luxembourg anyway okay fair enough each to their own amir amir kiai our policy coordinator what have you got for us um uh, hi good evening everybody thanks Maran. i tried to also cover different age groups and <laughs> um and so on with some recommendations and some ideas and also slightly reflecting back a little bit on uh, on the year from what we've been up to in our various policy teams, of course, uh, in, in the movements. Um, and there's a link as well coming right up from Davide where folks out there can uh, get access to uh, what we've been published already and what's coming up and so on. Uh, so please have a look at that. And if you want to get involved, please join us. Um, so some of the highlights from the year on this has of course been our uh, uh, second green paper on migration, our stance on Ukraine, uh, the peace proposal, on the nuclear energy issue. And just recently, last week, we sent out a survey questionnaire to our members uh, to gather views on our upcoming policy on post-capitalism. So, uh, you know, those are just some quick highlights from the year. And this year in 2023, just around the corner, uh, we've got um, uh, our updated uh, policy on peace and international politics coming up, updated migration policy, energy, housing extension to the Green Needle for Europe. So it's going to be a busy year ahead for the various uh, amazing volunteers uh, out there who are doing the incredible task of getting all these um, papers together. So also a big shout out to all our members and volunteers who are involved on our activist teams, on our campaign teams, on helping with the social media and so on. It goes, goes without saying always. Um, right, so just I had some books uh, to show you, uh, books I haven't, I've been getting, I got this year, but I haven't read. I've only started reading one of them because uh, you've sometimes seen my children and I hardly have time. Um, this year, of course, Iran has been on the public mind a lot more um, than uh, as it is normally uh, the case. And there's an interesting um, book about Iran, a uh, slightly different angle, of course, from uh, the topic itself that we have at the moment. But the author itself is also recommended. It's Hamid Dabashi. Um, the book is called Iran Without Borders. And, you know, viewers might find it interesting to also look him up and look at his other works. Um, then my other home, South Africa, which is also on the, on the news because um, our president, Ramaphosa, just survived a, 
Uh, one might say vote of no confidence, if you like. Um, however, the criticism is still there about what happened after the transition in 1994. There's an interesting book by Sizwe Mpufu Walsh, The New Apartheid, as well. It's worth looking at that book um, as we're also looking at uh, other countries in transition that we hope to see um, uh, transition out. But what happens afterwards, of course, is always the issue. Then, um, of course, the year of war in Europe um, is another book to sort of for folks to um, have a look at. It's called the Global Security System: An Alternative to War, and uh, it's you can find it in World Beyond War. Very interesting publication. It's more of a guide and a reference book, if you like. So uh, we can start imagining um, peace systems without the need for um, huge militaries and huge defense budgets, quote unquote defense budgets. Then um, slightly more lighter, <laughs> getting to more lighter stage. Um, folks who are interested maybe in, um, this is also a classic, of course, people who know it, know it. And those that don't will be interesting to have a look at um, sort of ancient uh, Chinese poetry. Tao Te Ching, it's a classic work, right, of Chinese poetry. Um, then if you have children uh, and you're looking for, it's, and your parents always find it difficult to find cool books um, in a sort of an early years stage, when they're older, they can, you can give them the you know, illustrated work of Karl Marx. But for now, um, for younger children, there's a book called Arabic Folk Tales. Um, and I'm going to show you the author now here. And as the author actually says, and if Mehran allows me uh, one minute to five seconds to read this, he says, um, in this collection, you find folk tales that have traveled a long way. Some of them were originally Russian, but when I heard them in Iraq, they became Iraqi. Um, and Ivan turned into Murat. And it also reminds us of the inter, you know, the universality of uh, of stories and uh, our humanity. So it's always a good one to look at. Um, some viewers might know I had the honor of visiting um, the Sahrawi refugee camps, and this is sort of the music from the Sahrawi. Sahrawi music is uh, really talks to the heart straight away. I would definitely worth your time on whatever music service you subscribe to. The other music that I found this year was a Norwegian band, Wardruna, which I found amazing, um, just by random. And uh, I show, I watch it with my kids and they love it. Um, and uh, film recommendation, also again, more classics because I don't get to watch movies, unfortunately, as much as I would love to, is uh, the trilogy um, by Nasser Khamir, uh, Wanderers of the Desert. Um, the Dove's Lost Necklace, and Bob Aziz, the Prince Who Contemplated His Soul. Um, I'm going to give it to David, and he will do the honors in the chat. Um, yeah, and just a little uh, last thing is, you know, tomorrow night is solstice, which is also traditionally the night of Yalda in Iran, um, but also the, you know, celebration, winter solstice celebrations throughout the world. And, uh, you know, what Dianis also mentioned earlier about, you know, the flame and the darkness holds true from tomorrow as well, because the day starts getting longer. Uh, so, you know, we're doing what we can, and please, uh, the only thing we can do is to get involved and to struggle together. Thanks. Thank you, Amir. And uh, just to follow up to the clarification I gave you earlier to show you how responsive our communications meme-making team are, they've already produced something relating to what I said earlier. I sincerely hope that's not going out anywhere, but I don't mind sharing it with you guys. Uh, Judith, Judith Maya. Uh, thank you, Mehran. Go. So uh, some of you may know that I joined uh, DM25 um, mainly because of uh, 2015, because uh, I was uh, following the, the Greek crisis uh, very closely and I even learned Greek uh, in order to be able to better follow uh, the news because in Germany, um, the reporting had become very one-sided uh, or maybe it became more obvious that the reporting was very one-sided. I think this, this always happens uh, in, in years where a lot of things uh, happen you know, they're saying there are decades when nothing happens and there are years where decades happen. So in those years where, where decades happen, um, the 
the, the onus is really on reporters uh, to try to convey everything that's happening to, uh, to the masses. And they're recently, they're failing more and more often in, in just letting us know what is going on, just the important uh, bits. And they're being very selective. So uh, I believe that um, in, in 2015, and uh, again now, as I feel time is accelerating again, uh, the onus is more on, on us to, to find these uh, different sources and to find, um, uh, to, to educate uh, ourselves uh, through, uh, through different viewpoints, through different uh, uh, sources, and try to find everything that is not being reported by, by our national media. And in the, it's also in that sense that I'm uh, worried about the um, developments around uh, Twitter because um, Twitter used to be this place where, where you could find out if uh, the Nazis were demonstrating in Berlin today. They could also find out if the guerrillas workers are, are organizing another strike. You could find out anything that is, uh, that is going on. And now it seems to become uh, way more one-sided. And if you want to find out any um, bottom-up activism, uh, and organizing, you can maybe no longer find it on this one place and you have to get out further and uh, look at other sources again and try to compile it from, from different websites and, and different streams. So, um, but that is work that I think we all have to, to learn again uh, for the next year uh, and uh, the coming year probably. There will be a lot to absorb and I really don't trust our, our national media uh, to keep us informed in the way that they should be. Um, so in that sense, uh, my recommendations uh, will be, well, <laughs> I'm sad to say that uh, it's still not available in English, but maybe you're lucky and, and speak one of the languages. Um, it's an author, um, a Finnish, uh, Swedish-Finnish uh, author called uh, Kalle Knivile. Uh, and uh, in 2014-2015, uh, he wrote books uh, about uh, Putin and uh, Crimea, and I've been rereading them now with uh, the, the start of the war in, in Ukraine. And uh, it's really fascinating uh, what he writes because he is really a source for uh, the people to, to see what uh, different groups uh, are saying. And in his books, he, he really doesn't give much of an own opinion. He's just reporting uh, the interviews that uh, he has with, uh, with people on the ground and giving very, very wide ranging views of um, uh, well, what, what he hears from, from different groups, uh, including in, in Crimea, there's one book that he wrote specifically about every group that uh, claims uh, Crimea. It's um, called Crimea is Ours, uh, where he doesn't specify whose it is, but he, he, he talks to all people who think that Crimea belongs to them. Um, in Esperanto, you can read it, Crimea ist das uh, Nia, in uh, Swedish, Krim uh, Tilher Os. It's also available in Russian and Ukrainian but not in English so far. And then he wrote another book called uh, La Homme de Putin, uh, Putin's people, uh, Putin in Vakia, uh, Putin's folk. So you can read it in Finnish, uh, Swedish or Esperanto. And um, basically he travels the, bre the, the breadth of, uh, of Russia and talks to the people that don't really get featured on the media, like the average uh, employee somewhere uh, far from Moscow who believes that uh, Putin is the best leader Russia has ever had and just tries to, to get a sense or, or even the people who are not staunch uh, supporters but somehow wound up uh, voting for him. It's, it's uh, quite fascinating. I, I really learned a lot from these books and from rereading them this year. Thank you, Judith. And uh, we've already had our a very animated debate on Twitter and Elon Musk two weeks ago. But since Judith just mentioned him, I, I, I feel rather triggered. So allow me to update some of my views on, on what happened <laughs> recently. I don't know what that guy's doing, but he's really making a mess of Twitter. I, I approved, approved the general direction, but these latest things like banning links to, uh, to uh, other social media sites, uh, he's kind of losing support fast. And it seems like, unfortunately, deservedly so. So let's hold out and see what happens with with Musk, but not looking good. Couple of um, recommendations from the chat. A Piragon, these are, these are books, so. A Piragon by Colin McCann, a novel on the impact of the Israel-Palestine conflict through the lives of two parents. Thank you for that. Uh, Elisabeth recommends the history of the Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. 
heavy stuff. And someone else recommends Caps Lock, how capitalism took hold of graphic design and how to escape from it. That sounds like a really interesting book. I'm, I'm definitely going to look that up. Thank you. Uh, Lucas, Lucas Febraro, our comms director. It's all short. Okay, so this is not going to be a recommendation, but I just wanted to... Um... Um, tell you about a personal journey I embarked, I embarked on this year. Uh, so I had never watched the Marvel movie um, other than the original Iron Man when it came out in 2008. And even then, when I was 17 years old, I thought that, you know, this is, something's weird going on politically here and I'm, I'm not sure I'm into it. So I decided that uh, I wasn't going to watch any Marvel movies anymore. And then this year, uh, because I was a bit bored during the summer, I decided to uh, watch all of them in sequence um, over the course of a few weeks, you know, uh, not on the same day or anything. But still, it's like 27 or 28 movies. Um, and look, I hate to be that guy, but oh my God, they're terrible. It's just, uh, I just could not, it's one of the most, one of the, <laughs> one of the most unpleasant experiences I've ever had in my life. Um, but I wanted to stick to it, you know, because I said I set out the goal and I really wanted to do it. But look, um, I'm here to tell you that uh, I was defeated after the, I believe, like the second Thor movie or something. I, I just decided that I couldn't do it any, anymore. Um, and again, I hate to be that guy. I don't I don't like dislike popular things just because they're popular. But it really is. First of all, they're terrible and they look pretty bad and the the, the scripts are bad. But also, it's just uh, military propaganda. It's it's incredible how how blatant it is, um, and it, I'm horrified that they're so popular and that so many people are watching them. I think, you know, this will be a dark chapter in the in the cultural history of humanity that will be talked about in schools with you know very solemnly um, a few decades from now. Hopefully, if things go well. So I just wanted to share that. So my my anti recommendation is don't watch um, don't don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> because it might uh, uh, impair your your mental capacities. Um, but also, um, if because uh, I didn't get very far, if uh, any of you have any recommendations for a Marvel movie that isn't actually garbage, that maybe I should jump forward and, and watch, uh, just to be able to say that I watched something that wasn't completely terrible, then I'm all years as well. Um, and other than that, just very quickly, uh, in terms of books, uh, I just wanted to say that I just finished reading for the first time How Europe Want to Develop Africa by uh, Walter Bordney, and it's worth every bit of praise that it's, it's gotten since it came out uh, 30 or 40 years ago, in my opinion, and I recommend anyone who hasn't read it yet, or even if you did read it, but it was a while ago, to, to revisit it because it really is an, an astonishing book. Um, and uh, since I just finished reading that, and since I, I, it got me so excited that I just bought this uh, this book as well, which is a collection of uh, uh, lectures by Rodney on the Russian Revolution uh, that were compiled into a book a couple of years ago, which looks very promising as well. So yeah, just to leave those two actual recommendations as well. Thank you for that, Lucas. Ah, Juliana. Juliana has some things you would like to add. <clears throat> yes, I've thought of uh, two things I would recommend. And uh, Lucas, I completely feel you. I did the same thing during COVID and I watched them all in sequence. And I thought like, I, don't, I, I cannot even imagine why somebody would spend money on producing those. But um, anyway, since that's popular. Uh, yes, I have a, a Spanish funny movie, actually, that I've watched. Uh, it's called The Good Boss with Javier Badem. Um, it's a story about a little company that's supposed to get a, a, like a, a, an award and the jury will come to see the company and he's invested in making sure he his employees get everything right and it's very funny so I, I'm not going to spoil anything uh, and the other thing is that I since nobody men mentioned it um, I think that the newest Star Trek series actually is very good the strange new worlds uh, with uh, Captain Pike and the series. Um, I mean, it's going back to the original storytelling of it and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, one last recommendation also would be to what I found for me this year, the last few months was uh, it's really good for the sleep to sometimes also switch off everything and just 
not be in front of the computer or a TV. And it has improved my sleep very much to turn off everything after 10 or 11 o'clock, to be honest. Um, so this is my last recommendation. <laughs> Well taken, Juliana. I, I can concur with that, um, although I, I don't always have the discipline to do it. Okay, we're at the top of the hour, and I'm going to hand the floor briefly to David, who's going to draw a name out of a hat. Is that a real hat you've got there, David? What is that thing? That you're it is a real hat, uh, actually made by my mum. And I was just, you know, I was looking for a nice container that would pass on the Christmas spirit. Uh, over and uh, this is what I found. So all the names that you've, you know, the people that you guys have been watching at home, you've been writing your names in the in the form, submitting your information. Uh, I've put them all in little pieces of paper, and they're all inside this beautiful hat. <laughs> and I will draw the draw them draw them in a minute, just the one winner, um, and then Mehran will let you know exactly how we'll get in touch with you uh, to tell you exactly what the price, you know, how to redeem your prize. But I also wanted to give you a couple of uh, recommendations before going on to the draw, if that's okay, because I've been listening attentively, and and now you're all kind of you know just to build up the the momentum and the suspense a bit um, regarding books. Basically, um, anything that Jose Saramago has written is a you know, Nobel laureate, a very, very uh, you know, interesting writer. If you don't know him, look it up. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, regarding some uh, TV series, Twin, I'm re-watching Twin Peaks. It's uh, David Lynch. I mean, if David Lynch is a very peculiar, very artistic kind of you know, filmmaker, and uh, he's, he makes very interesting work. So um, do look it up if, you, if you're interested. He's, he's made a lot of other... Uh, very cool films and, you know, kind of a little bit twisted in, in the mind, but very cool. Um, and also a, a series that I just finished watching this year is called is Better Call Saul, which is a prequel to Breaking Bad, uh, which in my opinion is even better than Breaking Bad. This is a, a huge discussion that's going on. Um, you know, Vince Gilligan um, is, a, is a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant writer and, and one of the, the main people behind the show. Um, and also P Peaky Blinders, um, you know, the British show about, um, how do I call them? Well, yeah, it's kind of a gangster, um, it's kind of a British Birmingham gangster series, very interesting as well, uh, very political. Um, so yeah, look that up if, you're, if, you, if that sounds good to you. Um, and then in terms of music, I'm, uh, I'm really into metal and prog rock. I think Eric earlier mentioned ghost i'm indeed wearing the t-shirt we went to the concert in brussels together that was a blast but uh you know my heart really sits with progressive rock so like porcupine tree and, and bands like that um but also you know i i also like you know other things like folk kind of duos like june road and many others so that's it for me um now can somebody do like a drum roll i feel like this is necessary i, I cannot do it maybe i can do it with one hand i don't know but uh, here we go. We're going to draw the name of the hat and uh, let's see who's going to be the lucky winner. I'm going to shake it first. One sec. Oh. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Let me, let me really move my hand around. Okay. Okay. Here's the piece of paper. Hopefully you will be able to see the piece of the name. I'm going to unwrap it like so. And the name is Mark C. All right, so Mark C, whoever you are, uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> and uh, we will be in touch with you um, uh, to let you know how you can redeem your prize. So back to you, Mehran. Thank you, David. Congratulations, Mark C. Um, okay, a couple of last recommendations from you guys on the chat. KP recommends Easy Rider. Uh, Pacheco recommends Gabor Mate's The Myth of Normal. Um, Dennis Hopper movies, again, the Easy Rider, last movie, uh, the last movie he was in, I don't know what that is, and Out of the Blue. Um, and someone else recommends The Office. Ah, good. I love a bit of Ricky Gervais in The Office. Well done. Um, a couple of little additional things. Thomas Mann's Reflection of an Unpolitical Man. And that, no, I don't think that's a, uh, <laughs> that must be a book recommendation, I'm guessing. Um, not that I would know. Okay. Thank you very much, you guys out there for watching us throughout the whole year. But especially, I would like to give a special thank you to our volunteers and especially our translating team 
who spend countless hours translating the well the text but also the i mean the transcripts of conversations like this one uh, enabling us to to reach more audiences across europe it's uh, a, a, a long tough job but we really appreciate your work and it's it's very very central to to uh, us being able to to spread the word about our movement guys thank you very much again uh, thank you to our panel and we will be back after the christmas break january 17th is the date for the next live stream take care happy holidays all the best to you and yours 